This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Wildfire. Over the last few weeks, we here at the Word of the Week have been talking about the sorts of natural hazards that find their way into fantasy games, video games, movies, and other media. But today's hazard is a little different. It's something we tend to think of as a modern problem, a sort of unintended consequence of the modern world. But it is as ancient as the world itself. It shows up in historical records and in the most ancient of our mythologies. It's terrifying, destructive, and it's deadly. But it is also vital to the natural world's survival. And where it destroys, it also renews and even transforms though the transformation may not always be for the better, as we're starting to discover. All right, enough fanning the flames of your curiosity with vagaries. We're talking about wildfires, and to some extent, fire in general. And we'll be focusing on the many meetings between humanity and that most beautiful, dangerous, destructive, transformative, and life-giving of all elements throughout the ages how we've protected ourselves from fires, how we've survived them, and how they've shaped history. But let's start at the beginning. Let's start with wildfire. A wildfire is an uncontrolled blaze that sweeps across the wilderness. Fueled by weather, wind, and dry brush, wildfires can spread quickly and consume everything in their path. Trees, brush, homes, and even people. In the United States alone, more than 100,000 wildfires clear four to five million acres of land every year. And in particularly dry years, when conditions are just right, or just wrong, depending on your perspective, they can burn up to nine million acres of land in the U.S., as they have in recent years. The reason we think of wildfires as a modern problem is because in the developed world, between 80 and 95% of all forest fires are caused by careless human beings or their trappings. Improperly contained campfires, carelessly discarded cigarettes, broken power lines, and even occasional arson account for the vast majority of these forest fires. But wildfires are a natural hazard. Just because these days in the Western world, most wildfires start with a human accident, that doesn't mean we're the only cause of such fires. When the proper conditions exist, lightning strikes can ignite forest or grass fires. Lava from volcanic eruptions has touched off massive wildfires, just to add to the list of the many destructive aspects of volcanic eruptions we've already discussed. And even a stray spark caused from a tumble or rock slide can ignite dry brush and start a wildfire. Don't believe us? Well, how about this? The first officially recorded fatality due to a wildfire in America, and the first officially recorded use of a fire shelter to survive such a fire, comes from the Journal of William Clark. Yes, the Clark half of the team of super explorers known as Lewis and Clark. In 1804, the duo had just left Fort Mandan in North Dakota and was making their way across the dry Midwestern prairie when they spied a wildfire sweeping across the plains. The account describes the fire front overtaking a number of Mandan Indians who were attempting to flee the blaze. They were burned to death. However, one Mandan woman saved her child by covering him with a fresh buffalo skin. As the fire swept past, the skin protected the young boy and the grass around him. The account also describes the speed with which the fire swept past the explorer's camp. Now that fire was likely started by accident. But a second account, several months later, of another prairie fire suggests that the Native Americans of the region were known fire starters. But not for the reason you think. According to Lewis and Clark, the Indians of the region were purported to set fire to chunks of the prairies to benefit their horses and to attract buffalo. But how? Well, wildfires can be very destructive, as we noted. But that destruction can have a very positive impact on the wilderness. In fact, biologists and ecologists have also known of the important role that natural wildfires play in the long-term development of forests and prairies. The thing is, as time passes, the wilderness regions become dominated by larger, older plants. Tall trees, tall grasses, whatever. 
These plants consume lots of nutrients from the soil and crowd out younger, newer growth. And of course, these plants die and leave lots of ground cover. Dried, dead leaves, dead falls of wood, and so on. That stuff doesn't always decay as rapidly as the forest needs it to, because that decay revitalizes the soil with nutrients. It's the vegetarian version of King Mufasa's theory of ecology that states that when lions die, their bodies become the grass and the antelope eat the grass. It stuff breaks down and it carries vital nutrients, especially nitrogen-rich nutrients, back to the soil. Fertilizing the soil, making it fertile. See? But if the old dead stuff doesn't break down fast enough, the soil doesn't get enriched. And the rotting and dead vegetation attracts fungi, insects, and bacteria that can pose a threat to living plants. The whole forest or prairie becomes a stagnant, diseased, rotting mess. Fortunately, it also becomes very flammable. When a fire sweeps through, it destroys everything. It kills all the old giant plants, it clears the ground cover, kills the insects and fungus, and turns everything into nutritious, ashy fertilizer. And so, a new prairie or forest can grow in its place, nice and healthy and young and vibrant, and herbivorous populations are attracted to the new growth and the food opportunities it presents. And then predators follow the herbivores, and a whole new ecosystem is born. Now, the Native Americans weren't the first peoples on Earth to recognize this aspect of fire as a source of destruction and renewal. In point of fact, not only have many disparate cultures figured out the importance of fire and clearing the old to make way for the new, lots of them have inexplicably chosen to commemorate it by associating it with a bird. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you'll no doubt remember Harry Potter's many encounters with Albus Dumbledore's favorite pet, Fox. Fox was a phoenix, a mythical bird associated with fire, healing, and renewal. When Harry first encounters Fox, he is alone in Dumbledore's office, waiting for the teacher. Just before Dumbledore arrives, Fox bursts into flames and dies, leaving Harry stammering out, I, I, I didn't do it, and it was like that when I got here, and the, the, the dog gave my homework. Of course, Fox is reborn from the ashes of Fox to Harry's surprise. And a few months later, that same school year, Harry is reborn from Harry after he's essentially killed by a deadly basilisk. Now, the phoenix is normally associated with Greek mythology, and the name derives from a Greek word that means reddish purple. It lived in Arabia and would serenade Apollo every morning as he woke up, got to his chariot, and prepared for his literal day job, hauling the sun across the sky. But the phoenix was a reference to an older bird from Persian mythology. It was called the Huma, or paradise bird. It was lucky and faithful. In fact, it was so faithful that mated pairs of Huma would grow together into one bird, joined by the wing and leg. But the Huma was derived from an older Egyptian bird called the Bennu, whose name means to rise up in the light. The Bennu gave birth to itself by setting fire to a sacred tree in the holy realm of Ra, the sun god, and it spent most of its days resting on a sacred pillar of rock known as the Benben stone. Every few years it would build itself a nest of cinnamon twigs, settle in comfortably, and then set fire to the nest. A new Bennu bird would appear in the nest, gather the ashes of the old bird, encase them in an egg, and deliver it to the city of Heliopolis. Interestingly enough, though, both the Hindu faith and ancient Chinese mythology also contain immortal firebirds, despite the fact there was likely no contact between these various peoples in the ancient world. The Hindu version was known as Garuda, and it bore the Hindu god Vishnu on its back. In China, the phoenix is called Feng Huang, and is associated with fire and the sun, among other virtues. But it doesn't burn itself dead and come back to life. It's just totally immortal. But it only shows up in the world during times of peace and prosperity. But we digress. The point is that fire, wildfires, and the transformative and renewing nature of such fires has been a part of human understanding since we first started writing stuff down, and probably long before that. But recently, some ecologists have started to question the conventional wisdom that a wildfire is generally good for an old-growth forest or prairie that the process of regrowth, called succession, 
was good for the right forest. Which is not to say every wildfire is a good thing. Many human-caused wildfires destroy healthy young wildlands. But naturally occurring forest fires in older wildlands were generally viewed as absolutely always good for the land. Ecologists at the University of Connecticut and others at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute have been studying the effect that wildfires and other man-made and natural disasters have on old-growth forests for the last few years. And they suggest that the benefits to the land following a fire or clear-cutting event may have a substantial cost. And that cost is biodiversity. Biodiversity refers to the variety of different living things that live in an ecosystem. After a disaster like a wildfire, the forest that returns may not resemble the forest that was destroyed. The plants may be less varied, providing a narrower variety of food sources for living things. That lack of variety may mean that the new forest can't support the same animals that the old forest could. In some cases, the fire itself can cause such irreparable destruction to an animal population that it never returns. It might even be killed off completely. Rare animals tend to vanish completely. With different prey animal populations, predator populations may also change or become unstable. And their work has a lot of implications for sustainable resource initiatives that focus on replanting or restoring natural ecosystems that have been harvested for resources. But regardless of the long-term impact that a wildfire has on an ecosystem, there's no denying that the short-term in-the-moment impact is pretty massive and destructive and terrifying, especially if you're caught in or near the fire, or even anywhere in the same postal code. That's because wildfires, when conditions are right or wrong, can spread farther and faster than you might imagine. Now, we should clarify what we mean by the right-wrong conditions, because the scope, power, and even the threat of a wildfire is highly dependent on a number of current conditions, especially weather conditions. The birth and spread of a wildfire is dependent on three major factors, temperature, wind, and moisture. Now, moisture is the pretty obvious one. If vegetation and ground cover is wet, it won't burn. But even humidity in the air can reduce the chance of a fire starting. That's because water tends to absorb heat that would otherwise cause fuel, like vegetation and ground cover, to ignite. Drought conditions and dry air drastically increase the risk of fire, and increase the distance over which the fire will spread. Temperature plays a big role as well. Even though a wildfire is generally ignited by a sudden spark, lightning strike, or a stray burning ember such as that from a campfire or discarded cigarette, such sparks might not actually manage to start a fire at all. See, the fuel that is going to feed the potential fire has to get hot enough to reach its ignition point. That is, the temperature at which it can sustain the chemical reaction that is fire. If the fuel is already quite hot, say because the sun has been beating down on it all day, day after day, for weeks, and there's no humidity to lower the ambient temperature, that little spark can be all it takes to push the fuel over that ignition point edge. That's why most wildfires tend to start in mid-afternoon, the hottest part of the day. While temperature and humidity play the biggest roles on whether a fire will start, the wind has the biggest impact on how the fire behaves and how it spreads. Obviously, burning debris from the fire can get caught in the wind and scattered around to ignite nearby fuel. That's pretty much how the fire spreads. Without that spread, the fire will quickly burn itself out. After all, once the fuel for the fire is consumed, there's no more fire. That's why wildfires generally take the form of fast-moving walls of fire, fire fronts. And while it might seem like a single destructive entity sweeping across the landscape, a wildfire is actually a series of new fires igniting as sparks and debris ignite neighboring fuel while the existing fire burns itself out. Hot, dry winds can cause the fire to spread quickly, such that the fire front can advance at 15 or 20 miles an hour, certainly fast enough that most people can't hope to outrun the front. And high winds can carry burning debris long distances so that the fire can spread across natural fire breaks, gaps in the vegetation and ground cover where there is no fuel such as rivers, streams, gullies, and even roads. In the right wind conditions, burning debris can ignite wildfires up to a mile and a half away from the fire front. This all makes wildfires dangerously unpredictable. As the wind patterns change, the fire can suddenly start spreading in new directions. High winds can push a fire over fire breaks that firefighters have cleared to control the spread of the fire. 
and they can cause secondary fires to spring up long distances from the main blaze. Firefighters have become trapped when secondary fires have sprung up behind them as they fought the main front. On top of that, the fire itself creates its own winds. Wind is, after all, nothing but the movement of air across pressure gradients that are generally caused by temperature differentials. A wildfire creates its own crazy winds. Thus, atmospheric scientists have been working for many years to develop computer models of how fires will spread based on what they call coupled fire atmosphere dynamics. That is, how the wildfire interacts with the air around it to change the wind patterns. One of the most spectacular, in the scariest sense of that word, one of the most spectacular examples of coupled fire atmosphere dynamics is the fire whirl or fire tornado. As hot air rushes upward and outward from the fire, it can start to spin itself into a miniature tornado. And that miniature tornado is filled with fire, hence the very descriptive name. Now, the fire tornado isn't like an actual tornado. It doesn't go spinning away and rip through houses and send little girls screaming and burning into magical fantasy kingdoms over the rainbow where they fall as charred remains onto hapless witches. And wouldn't that have made a very different movie? And much shorter. But they do hurl flaming debris over considerable distances. And frankly, a spinning column of animate fire hurling flaming debris every which way is a much better take on the fire elemental than the standard vaguely humanoid fire shape that you can kill with swords. But the wind doesn't just affect how the fire spreads and gives rise to fire tornadoes. The right wind conditions, or the wrong ones, can also help cause or prevent a fire, or help a small incidental fire grow into massive wildfire. That's because wind can carry moisture away, drying the ground cover out and preventing the water from absorbing heat. Moreover, if a fire does ignite, winds carry oxygen to the blaze and remove carbon dioxide. You might remember from our episode about chandeliers long, long ago that fire needs oxygen in addition to fuel and heat. Thus, it's really the element of wind and not the element of fire that makes wildfires so dangerous. Which explains why they are so prevalent in California. And that's because of the Santa Ana winds. Now, the Santa Ana winds are a seasonal phenomenon named after a canyon that's named after a river that's named after a saint. Saint Anne, or Santa Ana in Spanish, is the grandmother of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, non-canonically. She's mentioned as the mother of Mary as part of the Apocrypha, which are a number of written accounts by various early disciples of Christ regarding his teachings, his life, his disciples, and so on. But they were not incorporated into the canon of the New Testament of the Bible. And, by the way, they are the er example of something being deemed non-canon. Because the word canon refers specifically to the stuff that is part of the official holy writings of Catholicism. The word which comes from the Latin for standard or official, was later expanded to refer to anything that was officially a part of something. So you can blame the Catholic Church for inventing the concept that would later allow Disney to declare all those great Star Wars novels as not part of the official universe, sorry, Thrawn. And we should also mention that in television writing and game design, the term Bible is used to refer to the compilation of all of the official details about a setting, world, or fictional work. Although many Spanish explorers apparently passed right by the Santa Ana River in California as far back as 1542, it wasn't until 1769 that Gaspar de Portola actually bothered to note it on his map. He was leading the first overland expedition north from Spanish-controlled Mexico into Southern California. He dubbed it Rio de Santa Anne, because apparently he crossed it on or around St. Anne's Day. The Santa Ana River flows through a canyon, which got dubbed by the same name. And that brings us to the wind phenomenon. During the late summer and fall, cool air masses tend to gather above the Great Basin between the Sierra Nevada and Rocky Mountains. As the air mass descends the sides of the mountains into the basin, it drops much of its moisture and heats up substantially. The hot, dry air then rushes outward across Arizona and Southern California toward the Pacific Ocean. And as the winds are funneled through various mountain passes, valleys, and canyons, especially Santa Ana Canyon, they pick up speed and intensify. Hence the name, Santa Ana Winds. We should note that the Santa Ana Winds are an example of adiabatic, 
or phone winds. Another example is the Chinook winds that blow across the Canadian province of Alberta. The hot, dry winds are the perfect sorts of winds to help birth, nurture, and spread wildfires across the region. A wildfire can be a terrifying occurrence if you're caught in the wilderness. As noted, you can't outrun a wildfire. Once you see the fire front advancing towards you, you're going to get swept up. The only thing you can do is try to find some place safe to wait for the front to pass over or around you. Low-lying areas such as ditches or gullies can keep you alive, especially if you cover yourself with wet, natural, breathable material like wool or cotton. It's important that you breathe the air as close to the ground as possible, and that you draw the air through a wet cloth like a shirt or bandana. Because fires tend to go uphill, you should not. If you have the time, you might be able to clear a safe zone of brush and vegetation. You'll need about 200 or 300 square feet, so you should try to clear a circular area at least 20 feet across. A body of water can also provide you shelter. Once the fire front passes, it's generally safe to emerge from your hiding place. But be aware that the temperature of the area can be two to five times hotter than the area outside of the fire zone, even after the fire has passed, and it can take 24 hours to cool down. That also means that spot fires can ignite if there's any fuel left that the fire didn't consume. If you have to remain in the burnt hellscape for any length of time and try to establish any sort of shelter, maintain a careful watch for spot fires for 24 hours at least. And if you survive the terrifying ordeal of being overtaken by a raging wildfire and dodging fire tornadoes, at least you can find solace in the fact that the scorched earth will soon be teeming with life again. I'm sure that'll be a big comfort. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. 